In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Make us worthy, pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to himself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord, our God, the Pontificator, to guard us in all peace this holy day and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord God, the Pontificator, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself spared us, supported us, and has brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life, and all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of enemies, hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from your, your people and from this holy place that is yours. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us, for as you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through the grace, compassion, love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you, with him and the Holy Spirit, and the giver of life, who was one essence with you, now at all times, the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercy, according to the multitudes of your tender compassions. Blot out my iniquity, and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity, and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done evil before you, that you might be just in your sayings, and might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sin my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth, and you have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things in your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear the joy and gladness, and the humble jo bones may rejoice. Turn away from your face. Turn. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give to me the joy of salvation and uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your ways and the ungodly men shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. For, you de for if you desire sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in the burnt sacrifices. Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your good pleasure to Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be rebuilt. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, offerings, and burnt sacrifice, and they shall offer calls unto your altar. Alleluia. So dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, and that we come into your house, Lord. We thank you for the Sunday morning that we can come, Lord, and we can enjoy fellowship together, Lord. We thank you for the Eucharist, Lord, and the fact that the only thing that you possessed on this earth was your body and your blood, Lord, and you broke that and you gave it to us, Lord. So I ask that you allow us to receive that with a pure heart, Lord, but I also ask that you allow us to respond to your love, your mercy, and your kindness, Lord. So I ask that when we come here, Lord, that we, and we take you, Lord, that we are transformed into you, Lord, and your likeness. And I ask that you be with us in this upper room right now, Lord, and that you wrestle with our hearts, Lord, and that there's aspects of our heart that you want to address in today's talk, Lord, that you wrestle with them, Lord, that you point them out and that you point at them clearly, Lord, not only just to point out our sin, Lord, but that how that we can grow from that, Lord, and the steps that you want for us to walk through, Lord, so that we could be purified and sanctified by your goodness and your Holy Spirit. And I ask in session of all your saints from our tears, here's your pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So Claudia, does this, does this mic work? Should I just use this one? Or should I just play it safe and just stick with the one I'm already on? No, it's just, I'm just taking the stand.
right, guys, we are going to do a good old study, like a good old fashioned Bible study today, where we are going to talk about a story in the Bible that I think everybody knows, but it's one of those stories that if we were honest with ourselves, I feel like we get a little caught up on it because it's, it's a tough story. And when you read the story, um, I know at least, I don't know, for maybe the first dozen times when I read that story, I kind of liked it and I was kind of like, you know what, that's a little, that's a little stiff, right? Like, I don't, I don't know why it necessarily had to go that way. And I will tell you for our men's group on Thursday nights, we've been doing a study and we're walking through the book of Acts and ironically, I wasn't there when they covered this week. I was, I was missing that week, but, um, you know, maybe because I didn't get very, very into it, you know, I decided that we're going to circle back and we're going to talk about that today. Um, so everyone take out their, their Bibles, their phones, however you access the Bible when, when you have it with you and open up Acts 5. And there's something special about the, the book of Acts. One of the reasons we're actually going through it as a men's group. If, if you think about the book of Acts, that's what we should look like as a church. When you look at like how the church really started and you have this, this group of believers who got together and they started living their way, you know, it's really the perfect picture. Their church throughout the whole book, you know, you see so much power in, in the church. The church is growing. People are converting. The Holy Spirit is just doing amazing things. And as a church, when we look at that, we should say that, like, that's what I want to look like. Like if we were good, if HTC looked like the book of Acts, this church would be like busting at the seams. And although we are, I mean, we would be busting at the seams with people other than Egyptian people. Like if we were really seeing the, the work of the Holy Spirit thriving like that, it would be a, so attractive to like everybody. So we do, we want to become like this church. We want, to be, we want to become a church that God is doing such great things. There should be miracles before it to happen. If we want the church to look like the book of Acts, then we need to start looking like the people in the book of Acts, right? Like those characters that made it so strong. You know, the people who were, in the book of Acts, we're so committed. They were committed to prayer. They're committed to community, to communion, everything. And that's what made the early church so strong. And, and it's funny because in chapters one through four, you're just seeing like miracles after miracles after miracle. And the church is growing. You see some persecution, but even in the persecution, they persevere past the persecution and it's great. But then you get into the story in Acts 5.1. Now, if you have it open, someone just yell out, what story is it? And Ananias and Sapphira, right? Like it's one of those stories where everything in the book of Acts seems to be going rather well. You run into this and it's, 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 it's not a feel good story. So, and often a lot of the times, you know, um, when they offer like, there's so many people in the Bible that we will never know their names, right? Like it just makes a mention of a person that I feel that whenever God does make a mention of a person, like that means that that's an extra special story and there's something to learn about that. It's got to be for a reason, right? And unfortunately for Ananias and Sapphira, it was not a good reason. And so what can we learn from Ananias and Sapphira? And I know that many of us probably know this story. We've heard about it a thousand times. And again, it's one of those stories that a lot of times we, we scratch our head and we say that, you know, I don't know if this necessary, like, I don't know if God's right in this story. Like if you're honest with yourself, you would probably wrestle what he does in this story. But um, I'll give you some, some highlights just to refresh it, right? So the church, you know, the church is growing and the church that's growing has needs. So the members of the church decide that they're going to come together. A lot of them, you know, they offer their self. It's kind of like communal living. So you have people who are selling their possessions, giving it to the church. Everyone's kind of living together. In Acts 4, Barnabas sells his land, and it says that he sold his land, and he brought all of the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. So and then he asked in his wife, um, they sold a possession. They kept back a portion of it, okay? So not like, you know, Barnabas, he sold it all, and he gave it all. But for them, they, they, they kept back a portion of the proceeds. And first, and then he asks, comes down and he lays it down at the feet of St. Peter, um, implying that, hey, I sold this and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it all to the church. But St. Peter calls him on it. So St. Peter says, wasn't it all yours? When you sold it, wasn't it all yours? Like before you sold it, it was all yours. Even after you sold it, it was all yours. So why are you lying to God? And then the second that happens, what happens in NES? 
<laughs> that was his last day. Literally, like, <laughs> like he died, like then and there, just died. So a couple hours later, Sapphira comes in, right? And St. Peter asks, calls for her and he asks her, he says, did you really sell the land that you bought for for this sum of money? And she replies, yep, that's what we sold it for. And what happened to her? Dies, right? <laughs> like then and there, um, right there on the spot. And you think about that, and, if I, and, and I'll tell you my, my own thoughts. It's, I remember when I used to read that, it would floor me. And I always thought that, that that's a really sad story and that's a really strict punishment. Like no warning, no offer of repentance, like no, just nothing, right? And I remember a lot of times I used to really wrestle with like, why would God do that, right? Like clearly there was something good in these people, right? Like they left everything behind. They were living in the community. So they saw a need, they sold, they kept, you know, they gave most of it, right? Like probably like, ah, So, um, so there's, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of the times I was just like, this is, this is, it's, it's tough. But over the years, you start to realize that you just don't question God because God is just. And when you get enough mileage under your belt, you start realizing that there's so much unseen that we can always trust him because he's never been not faithful. So... <clears throat> So one of the things, one of the, the, the easy messages of this passage, right, is the first thing you want to never do is you want, never want to lie to or test the Holy Spirit, right? Can we agree that that's kind of like a very, very clear message? Like you don't have to have a lot of interpretation there. Like if you lie to or if you test the Holy Spirit, it's a stiff consequence. But there's a couple more deeper messages that I want us to talk a little bit about today, okay? One of the things I like to do is I have a certain number of points I'll tell you guys so you can track where I'm at in my talk. So um, if you feel like it's going too long, <laughs> like you'll always know how close we are to the end. But there's going to be four lessons that I picked up from this story, okay? The first lesson, be a good spouse. Be a good spouse. Because here's, here's the thing when I think about them. If either one of them was a little bit better of a spouse, could this all have been avoided? Hands down, right? It all could have been avoided. So the first thing you got to do is thank God for your spouse, right? Because we're, if you are married, right, you're very lucky that God gave you a spouse because that's a beautiful thing to have. And the Bible looks upon that very favorably. And if you're not married, you are very lucky. No, just joking. But <laughs> enjoy the season you're in. Enjoy the season you're in because God willing, there will be the season of marriage and you'll look back because each one has its own benefits and its own flavor, right? Um, but, but I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the things that always reminds me of how important not just marriage is, but fellowship in general, is the passage in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. It says, two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. He has no one to lift him up. And, there, um, and if two lay down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And the reason that this is really about more fellowship than it is about marriage is the next verse. And it says, um, um, and even though one can be overpowered by another, two can withstand them. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. So I will tell you that there's, God is basically telling us that there's a purpose to people in your life. There's a purpose for these relationships. Okay. Because it's much, much harder to do it all by yourself. And there's, it's much harder to fall and get back up. It's much harder to, you know, to stay warm. There's all of these aspects where there's a lot of value in the spouse that God had gave you. And I wonder, are we leveraging that? Because one of the things we did not, no one gets married to coexist, or we shouldn't at least, right? We are not getting married just to have kids. And that is not God's plan for your marriage either right? To coexist or just to have kids, right? And I will tell you, being, being a married man, that there is no bigger helper I have in my spiritual walk or my faithfulness to God than my spouse. And, and to be honest with you, that means a lot because I have a lot of godly men in my life who have full access to my life, who will speak into it. They're there for accountability, but there is no one who has a better view into my life 
than my spouse. And I think that's true for every one of us here. She gets to see the good, the better, and the amazing. Right? Is that how it goes? I think that's how it goes, right? <laughs> she gets to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? And if there's love in that marriage, then, then we will work towards that, right? For the sanctification that God is working in both of our lives. So we all need to look towards our spouses for that help and support. And I will tell you as a married man, it's not always easy to receive. It's hard sometimes to receive correction from your spouse, but it's worth it though, to give them the voice that they have the availability and the welcomeness to speak into it. So the first one was be a good spouse, be a good spouse. Second lesson, right? Second lesson I learned from this story, nothing good ever comes from lying. Nothing good ever comes from lying. You know, in verse three there, it says in NES, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Verse nine, how is it that the, the two of you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Like, how did you guys agree to a lie? Like both of you guys agreed on this lie. And I think that if we were honest, lying has become so socially accepted these days. People lie all the time and they feel that the lie is okay if it justifies the ends, right? Um, I, I heard this quote the other day. It says, we need to teach our children to lie, to lie judicially, but mercifully, but never maliciously. So like now all of a sudden he's saying like, we need to teach our kids how to be smart liars, right? Because there's times that it's okay to lie as long as it's, it's not like with a bad intent. And I'm like, is that where we've gotten to now? We're like, now we're going to even teach our kids that it's okay to lie. Um, you know, it's almost like they're telling us like there's an art to lying. Like there's times it's okay, right? And I will tell you that I, I remember I was serving one time and I had one of the youth come to me. And, um, and they, they came and they said, hey, I got into the certain college. You know, we wanted to live off campus. There's these great apartment complex like right off of like campus, like right across the street. But it wasn't student housing. So we were like, okay, well, you know, we don't have any income. How are we going to do this? So his dad was a business owner. So he says, hey, dad, can you give me some like fake pay stubs and some fake W-2 so I can like show like rental proof that like, you know, I can afford this place. And the dad said, sure, anything for you, son. So gave them all like the knocked off paperwork. They went, they submitted it to the apartment. Yeah, the apartment granted it to them. So they started living there and stuff. And the, and the kids started feeling like really, really guilty, right? So he says, I need to go confess this. So he went to his confession father and he's kind of setting the stage with his confession father and says, you know, Abuna, I go to this school and right across the street, there's these nice apartments. We really wanted to live there. And, um, you know, but it's not, it's not student housing. So there's no way they, they would qualify. And the priest looked at him and he says, you, Baba, this is what you need to do. You need to go to your dad. Okay. Have your dad give you paycheck stubs and W dues and like submit it. And I remember the youth was telling me the story. He's like, he's like, I looked at Abuna. I said, Abuna, that's what I'm here confessing, you know? And I think sometimes if we are honest, all of us, all of us, and it could even be from the top down, right? All of us really rationalize our lies. And I know at this place, everyone's shocked that like, you mean like Abuna did that, but I'm telling you guys, we do that and more, right? Like we do that and more in our own lives. Think about how truthful we live our life, right? There's nothing more truthful than like an, like, <laughs> like an eight year old at a restaurant that nine years old and like less like eat free, right? Because <laughs> I still remember going to like amusement parks and with like other family members and they'd be like, oh yeah, that kid, that kid, you know, that kid's four. It's like, mom, I'm six. She's like, no, shut up today. You're four, right? <laughs> but if you think about it, like, we do that so much and it's easy when we, we lie about like an age here and age there, but how much do we allow these little white lives to creep into our life because we think it's no big deal or we think on the other side of it, there's really no consequence to it. You know, I, I will tell you, you know, who knows how honest we really are. It is our kids. Our kids exactly know how honest we are. They know whether or not we always tell the truth. We know if we cut the corners a little bit. We know if there's a little area where we dabble in the gray, right? 
you know, I'll tell you, this is, you know, makes me feel old, but do you guys all remember that show? Like the, the dad who, you know, found drugs in his kid's room and he walks in he's like, what is this? What is this? Where'd you learn this stuff? Do you guys remember the quote of the kid? He says, I learned it from watching you, right? I learned it from watching you. And I wonder how much do our kids learn from watching us? I guarantee it. And we might downplay the whole thing about the lying and teaching our kids that you know, these little white lies, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. You know, there's, in, in Proverbs 6, there's seven things that says it's an, it's an abomination to God. Number two, a lying tongue. God hates it. Hates it with a passion. You know how you know that he hates it with a passion? Look what happened in Acts 5. They lied about it. They died then and there, right? He hates it. We can't get around it. Lying will destroy us. It will destroy trust. It will destroy our relationships. It will destroy our marriages. It will destroy families. And it's something we should have no tolerance in our own, li in our own lives, whether it's big or small. And I know that if we were honest, we would all agree that there are big lies, that there's no room for them at all. But we let a lot of little white lies go. That's not okay either. Lesson number three. Don't be proud. If you have any pride in your heart, right? Or if you're boastful or if you're doing things for that reason, it's like a cancer. Because why, why were they giving? If you look at the story, why were they giving? Was it about the poor? It wasn't about the poor, right? It was about them. It was 100% it was about them. It's about the way that they wanted to appear, is that they wanted to make a name for themselves, right? Personally, I think that they saw what Barnabas did in the previous chapter, and I'm assuming that everyone kind of like, you know, they were very impressed by that. They were very moved by what Barnabas did, right? They probably, Barnabas, to be honest, even though he probably wasn't seeking it, he probably received a lot of glory for that, a lot of attention. And that was a big deal. And I think that they wanted to be a big deal as well. Because the problem was, is they were faking it. Even as well-intentioned, if they gave away 95% of it, right? The fact that they were lying about that extra 5% is they were faking it. They were pretending to be somebody that they were not. They could have said, hey, we sold something and we're giving the majority of the money to, to the church. But did they do that? No, they were faking it right? Don't ever fake it. Because here's the thing. If you ever want to do something with good intentions, do it. A hundred percent of the time, God will bless that. He will encourage that. He will give honor to that. But if you do not have good intentions on what you are doing, do yourself a favor and just don't do it. And if that means that you have to search your heart before you're going to do something, search it and search it well. See, because it was their own pride that it made this act of giving about themselves. And like I said, I used to read this story and I used to think that like, you know, God was being a little bit extreme here. You know, they still gave the church their stuff, but after digging in, you're still realizing like, no, this was a very big deal. This wasn't about helping the church. They could have helped the church. They could have done it honestly. This was about lying that they were somebody that they weren't. And the hard part, and I think it's, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around, is the gift meant nothing to God because of the heart that was behind it. It meant nothing to God. God would have preferred for them just to keep their money, right? Keep your money. Don't fake it. Don't pursue the glory, right? At least they would have had more time for God to sanctify them, right? But because they did something that was so wrong, they just, that, that's it. It was done. And I think if, if I was honest with myself, they probably realized that there was sin in their heart, right? But they looked at the fact that there's sin in my heart, but I'm still doing something good, right? So maybe the good will outdo the sin and maybe we get a break even. Maybe I'm up a little bit even, right? And I will judge them for that, to be honest. But I know that in my, same, in my life, I do the same exact thing. And I think many of us do, right? Where we offset the bad deeds with our good deeds. And we think it's okay that like God will accept the good, but he'll turn his face away from the bad. That didn't work out well for him in this story. Not at all. 
right? And I'm going to tell you that it doesn't work out well for us either. It might not be as sudden and it might not be as drastic, but don't ever think that your good will, you know, have, because of your good, God's going to look at that and that he's going to turn his face away from your sin. That is not how it works. It will ne- we will never have a single thing to hang our hat on. I don't care what you do. I don't, how, I don't care how good it is. You will never have a single thing to hang your hat on. And if we were honest, we all need to be more humble about that. Because our good's not even that good. Sometimes we like to think it is, and sometimes we like to think that we, there's something in us. But our good is not even that good, so it definitely won't offset our bad. The thing that we need to remember is that God hates sin, period, 100% of the time. He will never be more okay with your sin because of the good stuff that you do. He'll never be more okay with your sin because you gave this, you gave that, you sacrificed this, you sacrificed that. What is the only thing in our life that will make God okay with our sin? To confess it, I'm going to tell you, even confessing is not enough. What is the only thing in our life that will make God okay with our sin? Any guesses? His blood? His grace? Even the things that makes him okay with our sin has nothing to do with anything that I've ever done in my whole entire life. Do you guys understand that? It has to be his cross. It has to be his blood. It has to be his grace. No good offsets. Like, there's nothing good that we can do that can offset our sin. It's, it's just him. And the thing is, we have to be honest. And what he did to Ananias and Sapphira he could do to any single one of us at any given time, and there's not a thing that we can say about it. We all deserve death. Like, it is that serious. And when you look at this story here, they were so worried about what other people thought of them. They were so worried about how they wanted to appear. They wanted to appear like Barnabas in like the previous chapter, that they sold everything and laid down on his feet, and everyone's going to be like, wow, that's a power couple, right? Like, look what they did. Look how godly they are, right? Does it really matter what anybody else thinks about us? It doesn't. It really, really, really doesn't. And I am telling you, if you're motivated by what other people think about you, you are on a very slippery slope. It's very dangerous. So the question is, is what is your motivation to do the things that you do? How would you be living if no one, if no one knew what you were doing, good or bad? Do we really serve to please God? Do we really serve because we are so in love with God and we are responding to everything he has done for us? Or do we have some other type of motivation? A part of that could be what other people see or what other people even think about. Because we should be be solely motivated by our love for God and what he's done for us. And the thing is, is there's no reward better than God's reward himself. And there's a lot of the times where if we were honest, we might have done some stuff and we start thinking like, you know what? I don't know if God rewarded me for this or if God rewarded me for that or I did this or I did that and I don't know if there's anything on the other side of that. And one thing I'll tell you just in general, you will never outgive God. Never. If we give him the smallest thing, he amplifies it. He multiplies it. And I don't mean that as a financial blessing. I just mean it as a blessing. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust to forget our work and our labor of love, which we have shown towards his name, right? He basically says he'll never forget. He's always going to reward. In Mark 9, 41, it says, forever gives a cup of water to drink in my name. Because you belong to Christ, as surely I say to you, you will by no means lose their reward. And I will tell you, we have promise after promise after promise where God says that I will reward. I will always reward. Don't think I won't reward. But we also have to be honest and acknowledge that when somebody else gives you a pat on the back or someone gives you a that a boy, it feels really nice, doesn't it? And sometimes it can sway us, but we have to keep our eyes on him, right? Because God's reward is always much better and lasts way longer. Lesson four, last one, don't be short-sighted. Don't be short-sighted. God sees all, God knows all, and we cannot fool him and we will never deceive him. 
Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. No matter where you go, there you are. Know how many times we have attempted to hide our sin. Actually, that's kind of funny, right? Because when we do something good, we do that openly, right? <laughs> but what do we always try to hide? We try to hide our sin, right? But no matter time, and no matter how many times we have attempted to hide our sins, are you successful? Like, are you successful? Maybe for a little while, sometimes we have some short-term success in hiding sins, but they always come out. But don't sweat it. We inherited that trait. That's not new to you. It's not new to me. It's not new to this generation. You remember Adam and Eve when they fell into sin? What did they do? They sewed fig leaves together to hide their sin. We've always tried to hide our sin. But we need to stop trying to hide our sins and to really start being honest. No more lying to ourselves. So where were Ananias and Sapphira short-sighted here? Right? Because they thought about that moment. They thought about that moment, like, man, we're going to go give up all of this stuff. Everyone's going to see it. We're going to get so much glory. They didn't think about the long-term effect of that decision. And I will tell you, they had long-term effect. On, they had an immediate long-term, like, eternity effect on that decision. But I'm going to tell you, you know, even if they didn't die, right, even if God didn't, like, you know, let that happen, think about it. They just wrote a huge check, but their heart wasn't in it right? They did it for the glory. Like they wanted the praise of everyone. And guess how long that lasts? How long before you think that would have become old news? Maybe a week, maybe a couple weeks, a month. Could have been a day if somebody came the next day and give something bigger, right? So, so many times we do something for the glory and the glory fades away, right? Whatever that short-term you know, sinful part of it is, we all know that we'll walk into situations because there's a, there's, there's a pleasure to it. But does that pleasure ever last? It never lasts. How many times have you made a short-sighted decision and you've quickly regretted it right after? It's funny, I had a guy that used to work for me, right? And I remember he did, you know, he, he made okay money. But one day he, he showed up to work in a new car and I'm looking at this car. I know how much I pay him, right? So I was like, I don't pay him enough to drive that. <laughs> so, so he came in um, and he was, dude, he was really, really impressed with it, right? With black, black on black, black wheels, black interior, supercharger, really fast, all of this other stuff. And, um, and I was like, hey, man, how'd you make that happen? He's like, oh, dude, I saw it at the dealership. I thought there's no way I could afford that car. And I was looking at him and I'm saying, yeah, there's no way you can afford that car. And then he's like, but, you know, I, feel, I realized, you know, with a, with a seven-year loan and this and that, and, you know, the, car, the car's high mileage, right? And it's like, it's got like 100,000 miles on it that I can, I can make it work. And I was like, huh, it was a Jag, right? I don't know how much you guys know about Jags, but um, a, a Jaguar is one of those cars that you only have it while it's under warranty, okay? So the problem is he was really excited about this decision because it looked really good, sounded really good. It was really fast. He squeezed himself out to kind of make it, to make it work for him, right? And in the short term, he was so excited with that car. And I promise you it lasted about three to six months, right? Because what happens after three to six months, right? He loved everything about that car other than the problems, other than the expenses, other you know, than everything else that came along with it, right? And after that, it got old, repair after repair. And he started realizing that it wasn't, the wor it wasn't worth the price that he was paying for it, no, how, no matter how many heads it turned. And then the, the kick of the junk on top of that is like the, the next year they redesigned the car and now the car didn't even look that nice anymore. He made a very short-sighted decision. And I think we've all had those short-sighted decisions in our life where we'll sign up for something and it ends up costing us way more than we ever thought that we would bargain for, right? And at that point, we, need, we realize that we really need to repent about it and we need to get straight and we need to get honest with God. And the heartbreaking part is for Ananias and Sapphira here, they didn't get that opportunity. That bad decision was the last bad decision that they ever made. It ended up costing them their lives. And I wonder if we're, we're living in some decisions right now that are very, very short-sighted. They're not long-term decisions at all. And we're stuck in it because we think it feels good, right? We think it's enjoyable. We think it's, it's for whatever reason, it's scratching our itch and we're really kind of holding on to it. But we know that we need to, that's a bad decision. We need to repent from it. We need to get out of it. So in conclusion, 
What if God dealt with us the same way that he dealt with Ananias and Sapphira? What if he didn't pour out grace upon grace upon grace, second chance upon second chance upon second chance, right? And I will tell you that most people, before God's hand of wrath does come down, you know what they always say? It was slow coming, right? They say, God, God was patient with me. He gave me so many chances, you know, but I was stiff-necked and I, and I kept going until his, his judgment finally did come down. And I'm going to tell you that what if that's what's around the corner for us, right? What if just because our punishment wasn't as sudden, you know, it doesn't mean that God doesn't see it and it doesn't mean that God's not going to hold us accountable. What if your judgment's right around the corner? Maybe he's giving us an opportunity to confess like today, the same way that he did it to, to Sapphira. Sapphira had that second chance where he asked her again. And maybe he's asking some of us like, you know, are you ready to come clean? Because my goal is for every one of us here that we can live our lives in a way where we can stand up with, with King David in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, where he says, search me, oh my God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in that way everlasting. Can we stand before God and pray that? Say, look everywhere. And if there's anything that needs correction, will you remove it from me? Will you allow me to like just to walk righteously? Because that's the goal for me. I pray it's the goal for you. I pray it's the goal for this church. And, and I promise you, you know, it's always one of those things where sin always seems to be worth it until it's time to pay the piper. And then we always look back and we always repent. And we always say it wasn't worth it. And I guess that's it. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because you are such a patient God with us, Lord. I read this story, and I just wonder, why did I get the grace? Why did I get the patience? Lord, why wasn't your hand strict upon me? Because, Lord, you would have been right. You would have been righteous. No one could have ever questioned your decision, Lord. But, Lord, we just thank you for the, the second chances, the third chances, the fourth chances, Lord. And I ask that you just that the Holy Spirit inside of us just convict us, Lord. That it'll make our way straight, Lord. That it'll teach us to offer you a pure repentance, Lord. Because we know that even these places that we go to, Lord, where we, where yet we attempt to find joy, we attempt to find glory, joy, Lord, we always come up dry. And it's never fulfilling. So, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you just send us your grace this week, Lord. That you just pour it out on us, Lord. That it bring us to repentance, that we confess any of the areas of our life that need you in it, Lord, or that we are hiding from you, Lord, and that you offer healing there. And I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, our many sins, Lord, and that you hear these prayers, lift in the intercessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Mary, all the saints and martyrs. Here's we pray, thankful in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.